gladly received. Yeah. You know, everybody don't, ain't happy to get the word, but they gladly received the word, were baptized the same day there were added unto them both 3,000 souls. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Fear came upon every soul, and one, many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and I had all things coming, sold their possession and goods, parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church data such as should be saved. Sometimes sometime we miss one of the most important parts of the 238 experience. One of the things, now again, I don't want to, to sound crazy. I don't want to. I don't want to sound like I just fell off the tomato truck or something. But, I, you know, when you start reading and, and you realize that the actual that ex experience was more than just an event. It really was an experience. You know, Sometimes, you know, I, 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 I think we just think it was just something that happened without any type of fallout from that. There was something that was unique about when they first heard the gospel and how it affected. It became more than just an eventful thing, but it became such an experience. It's almost like they got something in their experience that we didn't get in ours. It almost seemed like, and I know the environment dictates a lot, all right? They were born at a different time. They were under a different system. And a lot of that, they're going to do different things because of how they were born into that system. I understand all that. And so I don't want to come off as if I am saying, as we read from the text this morning, that God meant for everybody to go sell what you got and bring it, bring it home to Father. <laughs> no. I don't, want, I don't even want that to remotely be thought that this is what I'm saying, no. Because I'm not looking at it from the standpoint of what they were giving up, selling, had all things in common. What I'm looking at more than anything is the fact that in order for a people to do that, they must have came under such a tremendous covenant that they could trust in, that they were not afraid to experience. Because there was so much that we just read that I have never seen in Pentecost. I'm not saying that it's supposed to happen, but I believe the attitude that was in that place then needs to be restored again to us. That's all I'm saying. So I don't want to be misunderstood by what I, what I would say there and say, well, you know, uh, you know everything I, every time I say something, everything I say is scrutinized. <laughs> He's telling you, he's wanting all your possessions. I don't want anything you have. Okay. But I want you to have everything God has for you. Yeah. Okay. That's the most important thing in the world. It's not me getting yours, but we all get it what God has for all of us. And so we look at the lesson, which is called the principle of inaction, which is a high principle that we sometimes fail to realize, how important interaction is with God. I think me and Brother Thornton were just speaking in the room today, is that more 
than me trying to get along with you first? I need to try to get along with God first. And when I say alone, I'm not talking about A-L-O-N-G, but I'm talking about A-L-O-N-E. <laughs> if I can get a A-L-O-N-E with God, then I ain't going to have no problem in getting A-L-O-N-G with you. <laughs> okay, so first and foremost, in all the interactions, we have to come under the conviction that me and God have a covenant. That is very important. I'm not just talking about your average contract for a mortgage. I'm not talking about those kind of contracts. You need to understand how strong his covenant is with you. I need to understand that more than anything in this life. Because if I understand how strong his covenant is with me, then I am free to become and perform the purpose of God in the earth. But I need to know his covenant. Because as much as we have heard in our minds, scriptures such as God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But then at the same time, knowing that and hearing that, it's not changed the fact that sometimes we don't believe that. We're still constantly being bombarded and separated from the thought that God could love me in spite of me. Okay, so being in covenant with God is one of the most important truths I think you can have. God is for me. God is always. God will always be for me. God is for me right now. And I don't care how I look, God will always be for me. Well, praise God. And so we look in the book of Acts and see how the church seemed to have started on the foundation of having a very meaningful relationship with each other. Very meaningful. It wasn't a facade. And I know that at that time it was you was kind of like pressured into whether you want to be or not. You was kind of like if you became saved, you what you really didn't have too many choices on how what community you was gonna live in. You know what I'm saying? And I say community because that's very important. Because a lot of times we want to have communion without community. And you cannot have communion without community, which comes out common union. So all these things fit into interaction and how we interact with one another. They realize that you can't really function with a distrust. They, they realize that, you know, in, in the kingdom of God, and, I, and I've been guilty over the years, been guilty. I just got that ninth sense, you know, <laughs> that kicks in. Now, number one, I don't want you to think that you have to be a fool to be saved. I don't want you to think that you have to be naive to be saved. Now, I'm far from naive. Trust me. I, I can see you coming a mile away. I can tell how your head is shaking. Well, no, we're going to be shaking. <laughs> you know, I already see you coming before you show up. So I'm not naive at all. And so I don't want you to think that, you know, we have a world out here that try to use who we are. It's just like I just had a young man came in here just a while ago trying to chase down my sound man over here. <laughs> And so when he came into the church, I already knew. Oh, he said, oh, y'all getting ready to have church? Yes. I said, he said, uh, I was wondering, can you help me? I said, well, what do you need, the word of God? Well, yeah, that's good too, but no. But see, I already know what he came for. Well, brother, wasn't you all to show them love? I did. I offered them something that money came by. Amen. 
Oh, Brother Wilson, you should quit. Yeah. I mean, this is more precious than gold. <laughs> and he could not, of course, then he ain't staying. They didn't notice he ain't here, right? He didn't want that. That's cool. No problem. But here we're going to look at it in Psalm 133. It has always been uh, a tremendous scripture for me. I think the longer I live, the more it becomes clearer to me what it was saying. Now, sometimes you only understand the scripture at the place that you're living at the time you're reading it. And it don't have as much meaning to you until you start experiencing what it really was saying. Then you go back and read the scripture, then you understand what it really meant. Now, he says, behold how good and, ple and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in, see again, unity. Now, good and pleasant dwell in unity. Then he goes on, it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. In other words, it said unity is kind of like a covering. Unity is like it, it starts from the head, it'll go all the way down to the hem of your garment. And everybody always wants to be anointed. Everybody always talks about their anointing. You even got people praying to have an anointing. And it all begins in unity. Well, see, if I, like I said, if, if I am unified with him, then I don't have a problem in being unified with whatever's in him. But when I'm out of alignment with him, I'm out not just alignment with him, I'm going to be out of alignment with everything that pertains to him. That's including you and everybody else. But he goes on to say, as the do of Hermon, and as the dew that is sent up on the Mount of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life evermore. Lord commanded the blessing. Man, I used to read that and then, and then quite realize what, where the blessings of God are commanded. That means it, it ain't even something you got to ask for. They're commanded because I came into a place of unity. Blessings are commanded. And matter of fact, the Lord you got, the more blessed it was. Because as you notice, the Bible said it ran from his head and landed in the hem of his garment. And he said it was there. It was there. The Lord's blessings are commanded. That's why the Bible says he giveth grace, more grace, to the humble. It's not how high I am, but it's how low can I go because my being low means that I am helping somebody else up. Right? So now, the more I help others to get up, I am experiencing more blessings than the one who thinks they're on the top. You know why? Everything dries fast on the top. That's why the rivers that runs out the mountains use a lot bigger at the bottom than it is at the top. So what are you saying, Brother Wilson? Well, see, this is what they're trying to tell us. A lot of times they said we've We've turned the scriptures around where it looks like, you know, if you're up here, you're closer to God. And yet he says, but you're down here where the skirt, the hem of the garment is, you're more blessed down there than you are up there. Well, it's just my, just thought. It seemed like to me that the scriptures are trying to explain to us that there is a blessing in unity that seem to attract God greater. Because it attracts something. We can go back to the Tower of Babel. It attracted, they, had, they were unified. 
right? They were just unified under the wrong spirit. But what they were unified under the wrong spirit, it attracted a strong spirit that gave them an idea that we're going to build a gateway to heaven. We're going to build a tower that reaches all the way to heaven. And, and God said, man, these people are so together. I wish they could get together in me like they got together in that. <laughs> he said, and they so together said, if I don't stop them, if I don't confuse them, there ain't going to be nothing that they won't be able to do. Now, I know, it's, and you know what, it's easy for me to believe that the wicked can do more than God. Yeah. It, it, it's a lot easier for me to believe that the wicked man can build bigger things than God can. It's easy for me to believe that. Because I'm sitting down here right now looking at what man is doing right now. Man, he got spaceships can go all the way to Mars. Not that I want to go. But I mean, he's, the things he can do because they put their minds together and try to abort or thwart the works of God the things that man can do. And God says, if I don't shut that down, there ain't going to be no restraint of what man can do. Taking that in its proper place and realize then, and what did God, he knew that what unity could do. And so what does he do? When he gets ready to build his kingdom, he wants to unify his kingdom. He wants to bring his kingdom into that oneness like they were at the Tower of Babel. So he can say, now that y'all have become one, there is not anything that y'all cannot do. Hmm? That's not one thing that y'all cannot do. Because the more unified you are, the more you attract me. And the more you're going to display me because... We're going to read the scripture after a while where he, he wants you to become one. Not two. Not three. Just one. How are you going to become one? Because you're not going to become one in your flesh. He's already messed that up. <laughs> huh? He already knows that ain't going to work. He, he knows that's not going to work. So, there's only one way, that's only one way possible that God could ever bring about a new community in this earth and a new unity in this earth. And he did that on the day of Pentecost. That's what, that's, what, that's what the Holy Ghost was all about. It was more than me speaking in tongues. But the Holy Ghost was those tongues that was being given to us. What's to really signify that God, once again, is bringing men back into one language again. Huh? Yeah. And that language is not one of human nature. And, and we still want to speak the tongues of the human man, but God has a language of the spirit that brings us into unity that will demonstrate who he really is. Tongues is not just a, 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 a Sunday aerobics class, you know, uh, this little thing in the mouth. But it really, it should really tell you how unified you are in Christ. Praise God. Okay? That's why I said they were praising God and having found, found favor with the people. And the Lord added to the church name such as should be saved. Praising God. And have in favor with all the people. But you know who they had favor with before they had favor with people? They got favor with God. The most important thing that you want to have is what? Favor with God. If you got favor with God, you ain't got to worry about favor with people. That's one of the added blessings of getting God's favor. Well, not getting his favor, but understanding that you have God's favor. Part of your really walk in God is knowing I have the favor, I am the favor of God. I, I, I know he favors me. I know, I know sometimes it sounds cocky to people, but if you don't believe God favors you, then who do? 
And that's the reason why you give more credit to the devil's destroying your life than the favor of God that will restore your life. I believe God favors me. I believe I am highly favored of God and deeply loved by it. Now, you may think otherwise, but I'm telling you what I believe. I don't know if anybody, matter of fact, I've been talking to God about it because I'm trying to figure out how could he love you as much as you think he did when he loved me like this. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. That's not where we start, okay? If you, if you will notice, tongues were not started like that. Tongues were started, first of all, unity. Remember, they were all in one place and one accord, one mind, Okay? Now, God's answer to that unity was that, and then cloven like tongues of fire set upon each of them, and they began to speak in those unknown tongues. Now, generally what should happen in any time we come into unity with that covenant, these things should probably happen to us. It should happen to us. Why? Because it's signifying one thing. You know what it's signifying? We have come into the unity of the Spirit. God is not going to have five different languages. He scattered the language when man came into unity without his Spirit. He brought us back into unity by, once again, creating a new language of the Spirit. So it's not a matter of me, first of all, making a decision can a man be saved without tongues? Because then we're pushing tongues without salvation. They didn't preach. On the day of Pentecost, if you'll notice one thing, they didn't preach tongues when they got up to preach. They preached Jesus. In the process of preaching Jesus, someone asked the question, what must we do to be saved? So most of the time we want to give you the doctrine of salvation without giving you the Savior that saves in salvation. And this reason why today is that most people believe that the church saves me and not Jesus. First thing they'll say, do I have to go to church to be saved? Now, if I believe the church saves me, then yes. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating that you don't have to fellowship in the body of Christ. But I cannot substitute Jesus for the building. Most people tell you, come on, go to church with me so you can get saved. And the reason why they're going to tell you that because they don't have enough Jesus the guilt to the people that's asking. <laughs> there is no magic in the bricks. All right? The house of God has changed. We're just discussing this. Had a guy call me this week. And God has shown me this week. He said, the more man got away from the Garden of Eden, the more decadent he became. You know, the Tower of Babel, you know what the problem was? They thought the way to God was through brick and mortar. <laughs> and you know, no matter how well you make the brick, and no matter how well you make the mortar, that's not the way to God. That's not the way to heaven. Jesus Christ said, I am mm -hmm, the truth and the life. So the question is not, we can sit here and argue about all day. Do they have to speak in tongues? First of all, speaking in tongues is not the question. The question is, are you willing to come into unity with Christ? Because you can't be in unity with him without speaking his language. You're not going to be in his spirit 
without having the language of his spirit. So it's not, we almost want you to speak in tongues to satisfy us. I don't need you to speak in tongues to satisfy me. Because even after you've spoken in tongues, what's going to determine whether or not that tongue was working for you is how you came in unity with those tongues. And what I use the tongue for. It's kind of hard sometimes to think how we spoke in tongues with the Holy Ghost and then take the same tongue and kill our brother. Yeah. So speaking in tongues alone without having the idea of unity ain't helped you at all. Because if I'm using my tongue to keep killing you with my tongue, that is not the Holy Ghost. Amen. You're never going to do that. So I need you to know who Jesus is, first and foremost. Preach Jesus. Tell people the good news, what Jesus done for them. That's before they ever spoke in tongues. Jesus done some stuff for us before you ever even came to church or came to a fellowship, heard a preacher preach. Jesus already done some things for you. We needed people that knows how to deliver the message of the gospel of the good news. Instead of people walking around on Prozac and everything and going crazy, they need to know, first of all, there is a God that has not going to forgive you. But he has forgiven you. And that when I read John 3.16, it's not a fantasy anymore. For he did so love the world that he gave himself for. Gave himself for. And that what he done, given himself, he died like me and died for me so that I could be risen with him to live with him. That's settled. Okay, that's settled. Right? He can only die how many times? Yeah, that's the reason why some of y'all looking for a new year. I'm going to keep telling you, you need to find a new day. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, if it come back, you probably, you getting close to 50? <laughs> yeah. Well, but see, here, here the thing is that you're not, first of all, God never was intended to be understood from the outside. All right? God never intended for me to sit down and analyze to see whether or not God is God. First of all, you will know no more about God than you're willing to experience in God. If you don't want to experience God, that is your choice not to. God is not going to force anybody. It's, it's loving truth and loving Jesus. That's the most important thing. Do I love Jesus? Yes. Do I love truth? Yes. And then if I'm going to say that and love that, then you know what I'm going to be open to? I'm going to be open for him to show me his truth. You ain't got to, you can't argue. See, one thing you can't do, you can't argue truth, okay? Well, I, I, I mean, I've read books. Matter of fact, most of the books of these people, I was, the book that caused most people to leap that believes in some things that's not even scripture came from a guy who did not believe, believed that anyone who spoke in tongues was of the devil. But God showed him the end time. Now, that's, that's kind of hard for me to even reconcile. Mr. Larkin believed he, he, did, he did say that in his book. And I got the book, so I already know. I had to go by to make sure that I didn't misquote him. But he believed that if you spoke in tongues, you were of the devil. But this same man got a whole book put out there that changed everybody's mind about God. I just have a real problem with that. Now, I, I understand the human nature. Human nature is like this. Anytime you hear something that's new and you have to try to log that in your mind, you have, you're either going to be Berean about it or you're going to be a, a, a Stonewall Jackson. You're going to build a wall up and, you ain't gonna, and you're going to attack it. That's, that's our first recourse in anything. To hear something that we never heard before makes us put them walls up. Some people are going to be studious enough to say, you know, I'm going to check that out and see what it says. 
Does it really say that? But then, you know, most of the time is that we want to fight. There's nothing more. Religion has killed more people than most of our wars have, because most wars have some religious overtones. More people have died at the hands of religion than anything else in the world. And they're yet even dying today. All these ISIS and all that. What is that about? Religious dominance. Somebody wants to make everybody believe that religion is more dominant. Now, they got a different style. See, they don't ask you to carry a cross. But they will ask you to give your head up. They have a real strange kind of God that he don't want you to come on your own. They put a knife to your throat and ask you, is it Allah or is it Jesus? Now you got a little choice there. What do you want to believe? Well, with this cold steel on my neck, it could be Allah today. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I just play it. I just say <laughs> But this is what we are against right now. So, first of all, is that the Holy Ghost in you. Jesus not one time ever came. If you notice, you, you can't believe the things these people were believing. When he came, they even had the same book that he came out of. They had the book. They were reading the same book. When he showed up, they were reading the book. The first half, all of that, they was reading all that. But when he showed up, they didn't recognize who he was. They had got so caught up in the brick and mortar that when he showed up, instead of them embracing him, guess what? But he never argued. They didn't even question him. Are you a king? And what, couldn't it have been just easy for Jesus to come out and say, hey, I am King Jesus. I am the king of kings and Lord of lords. But he not one time ever overrode their ideas. He said, thou says, what do you believe? Are you the son of David? He don't argue because number one, this is why it's important for you to know who you are. Because once you know who you are, you don't have to argue with anybody about who they think you are. Amen. You know who you are. He never argued. Yes, ma'am. Well, here to say is that first thing you need to do is preach to people. Our message is one. It's, it's, it's called Jesus. That is the message. That's the good news. And, but I need to know what Jesus done. Acts 2 38 was in response to when they heard what Jesus done. If, if we present Jesus like he need to be presented, people will be asking you the same question, what do I need to do? Instead of you having to tell them what to do. See, we go in with an argument. Now, I, I, I've been an apostolic all my life and I always went into witnessing, assuming, number one, that you don't know how to be saved, so I need to, first of all, make sure you get this right. And when I first came into church, first thing they hit me with is, you got to be baptized in Jesus, now. you got to be baptized in Jesus. Now. Well, I don't even know if I even know who Jesus is. Because last time I heard about him, he gave me cookies and Kool-Aid in, in Sunday school. <laughs> and I'm not sure he got any bigger since then. You know, so they hit me with all this, man, whatever you do. You know, we go in with a defeated mentality that our message is not powerful enough to cause a person to want to be what we think they need to do before they even know who he is. That's why a lot of people went through that, got baptized in Jesus' name, got filled with the Holy Ghost, but they never knew who Jesus was. And after a while, it became another religion. Come on. What, what he wanted to do, it was more than just a religious act and a ritual. We made baptism a ritual. It's not a ritual. It should be born out of relationship because when you understand what baptism does, it's more than getting wet. Amen. Know ye not, they which are baptized into Christ have done what? Have put him on. 
They didn't, I, nobody told me that when I got baptized. No one even mentioned that. As a matter of fact, they told me just the opposite. Now you got baptized, you better make sure you keep Christ. When I got baptized into him, I put him on. And he's not one of those garments you bought at Von Mars. Amen. Take off and put it in the closet. When I put him on, I put on a whole new man. Yes. And then they got me turning around trying to fix the other guy I should have been taking off. <laughs> I was more interested in fixing the one that can't be fixed instead of developing the one that he just gave me, Amen. the new man, which is after true right, righteousness and true holiness, the new man inside. Oh, we, I hope I get that scripture for this day as out. Well, you know, and the thing about it, I'm not, I, I believe if a person is baptized, they need to be baptized in Jesus' name, period. There ain't no, no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. So I don't believe there is any other name, titles, or anything else you can be baptized into but the name of Jesus. Because, them titles, them not names, I'll say. And, and if, if it's not a name, see, the most important thing if we're going to use titles for baptism, then we need to use titles for casting out demons. Mm -hmm. I, I, I very rarely, I, I didn't see no place in the Bible where any one of those apostles, the disciples, went anywhere and cast the devil out by using Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Not one place. I didn't see any place in the, even in the scriptures where they use any other name other than Jesus Christ in baptism or the Lord. And I know the Lord is Christ, the Lord is Jesus. I, I, I don't believe, I believe when they use that, it's interchangeable. But Jesus' name is the only name given. Yes. Whereby man must be saved. So if I believe that baptism is a part of my salvation, then I can be baptized in anything other than his name. Because anything else is going to be spurious at best. Well, church history is laden with a lot of misconception. And I think there's something good in knowing church history. But you have to always remember what church history is. Is his story, somebody else's story about church. Let me throw this in real quick. Most of the books that you're going to read, whether it be commentaries, whatever books you're going to read outside of the scriptures, you're going to get somebody else's slant on what he considered history to be as pertains to the church. So if I've read everything that's so-called uh, in the archives of church history, and I can go through a whole bunch of names, Matthew Henry, a lot of stuff like that, you read that kind of stuff, and notice one thing is that they are only telling you what was recorded before them, and somebody got a hold to everything and kind of put things together to make you believe stuff that they wanted you to believe. That's why we have such a hard time today trying to determine what it means to be a Christian. Because in every history and every historical era, there was something different being legislated down to create or form what we call church. Okay? And that's why if everybody was really seeking after the one thing, the one person, the one spirit, we wouldn't have 800 and some different denominations. Amen. All right? How, how is it that 
He can baptize us all in one spirit, but we got about, yeah, about 800 different denominations. Well, I believe this is all you got to do. See, I, I, I believe this here. Even Acts 2.38 2, is not enough. Amen. All right? I don't, I don't believe that ends it either. It's a good start, but it's not the end. And so we got the Acts 2.38 people. We got the Trinitarians who are not real Trinitarians. They just think they are. They don't know it's a mystery. I don't believe there's such thing as a real, true Trinitarian, even though they, some people say I'm Trinity. They don't even know what Trinity means. They have no idea because they can't explain it. No. And there's no way that if I told you what it, what, See, it's not what you think it means today. If you're going to know what something means, go back to when it was mentioned and said and see how they came up with the idea that you were trying to believe in. Such as Trinitarian doctrine. You know the Athanasius Creed. It says uh, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, but the, the Father is of the Son, the Son, of, and he's not of this and it. It's got a whole lot of mumbo jumbo. I, you know, if you want me to one of days, I'll try to get that paper to you. But it's such a mumbo jumbo, when you get through reading it, you ain't read nothing. Like you done chewed on some bad cornflakes or something. So, church history, no. The most important thing is not so much how much you it can explain church history and church doctrine. It's how your relationship with God is going to transcend everything else that anybody's going to say about God because they can't tell you enough about God because most of the time all you're reading is what they said about God, but God did not come to have another mediator between you and him. There's only one mediator between man and God. And his name is Christ Jesus. So he don't need me to mediate to you. I can't mediate to you the knowledge that you're going to really need. I can plant seeds. I can tell you things that inspire you and that stir you. But at the end of the day, what you're going to know about God is what God's going to be able to show you himself or you won't know who he is because you're going to always be basing your experience. Well, you know, brother, uh, God done it for Brother Wilson. I know he'll probably do it for me. No, you, you, you probably don't know that. Okay? But you will know that when God began to show himself strong in you. I was in there even this morning, we was just talking, and, and the Lord began to show me again. I, 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 you know, sometimes I preach things and talk things, and it didn't really register good and strong then, but it, later on it came back because it was just another stepping stone into something else. And I remember preaching one Sunday morning about the osmosis deal, how that worked. You can take a thin membrane, separate two bodies, two equal amounts of water, and put a thin membrane between them and make one of them salt water. And in time, guess what? It's going to happen. All the water in the bottle is going to be equally salty because the heavier, stronger, will overwhelm the weaker. You say, well, what does that got to do with me? You know, sometimes Paul, he made a statement one time. He said, in my weakness, his strength is made, you know why? It's called osmosis. He brings in the balancing. That's what grace does. Then Paul said, you know what? I'd rather be weak. So I, I can have osmosis. <laughs> because the covenant is about like osmosis. In the covenant of God, works like this. Whoever is the strongest must be the one who makes sure the covenant is kept. Can I ask you, which one is the strongest in your covenant? Is it the one who made the covenant himself? Or is it you? It's him. He's the covenant maker. That's why he said, I, this is my covenant. This is my 
new covenant. I made, I made this with my own blood because the strongest covenant that can be made is a blood covenant. But the only thing about this covenant, it didn't require yours. He made it with his own blood. And for him not to uphold his covenant, it means that he would have to suffer the death that you suffered, which he already did, to make sure you got his life. Everything about this is so simple and very powerful. John 17 and 21. This is called the Lord's Prayer. I know we got one we call the Lord's Prayer, but this is really the Lord's Prayer. This is what Jesus prayed, the Lord's prayer. He said that they all may be one. You know, we, we, we mentioned a lot of times, especially in our group, we're one this Pentecost. I wish that was true. His prayer was that we all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gave me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. What is power? His, his, his prayer for oneness, for unity. And matter of fact, he said, matter of fact, the world, he wants the world to know him through that unity. Know that, that you've loved them like you love me. Make them one like we are one. And then the world will see that and they're going to say, like they said in the book of Acts, we perceive that these people have been with Christ. When was the last time somebody got that perception of us? We have become the church. And when I say church, I ain't just talking about us. I'm talking about, in quotation, the church world has become their worst enemies. Because you know why? We don't strive for unity. We don't strive for oneness. We don't strive for any. Matter of fact, we, we are at war with each other all the time. We are trying to uh, tone it down a little bit and, 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 and force a, a unity that's not, for, or not given us by the Spirit. It's more out of flesh. <laughs> they had a good thing going around in the city one time. And they felt like you know, like on Sunday mornings, we don't have a lot of churches are going to be like their communities. We're going to be, you know, if we're in a ghetto, we're in a ghetto. If we're in suburban, we're in suburban. But that's just the way church has been. And so we wanted to try to force people to get together. So you can't force unity. Unity is never forced. It's embraced. And they thought maybe if we just get together once in a while in the same church building and somehow we're going to be unified at least for that day. But see, God is not looking for these facades. He's looking for a real live unity where people are really unified, really live in the love of God, really desire to be one, not just with each other, but one with God. First and foremost, everything I'm going to tell you has to start with Jesus. Everything I'm going to talk about. Because if I don't start there, nothing else I'm going to do is going to really matter. Jesus has become my full purpose. That's my purpose. I want to know him. You got to have the same idea. I want to know Jesus. We look at, in the book of Judges, we're looking at Gideon. I hope this clock is right. Is it right? Well, we'll worry about it. It'll come now. But anyway, uh, Here's Gideon. You know, remember the Midianites? Sometimes our, our, our worst enemies is family. Come 
The Midianites were some cousins. <laughs> if you remember, remember Moses and his wife. This poor, and uh, if you remember, Jethro was his father-in-law, and Jethro was a Midianite. So they were kin people. And I can take it back farther than that, even in Abraham, when she had sons by Keturah, after Sarah had died, one of his sons named was, he became the father of the Midianite, Medan. Okay, so they had family ties. The only thing about the family ties is that one was kind of like under the covenants and the other one wasn't. It's, it's like, you know, even in our families, we're going to have those in the covenant <laughs> and those that's not in the covenant. And generally what happened is that the ones that's not in the covenant seem to be doing a whole lot better than the ones that's in the covenant. And sometimes they use their ability outside the covenant to try to always keep you down. So what happened is you got Gideon and these Midianites have totally oppressed. Every time the uh, Gideon and them would get something together, the Midianites would come in and try to destroy it. They had a system set up where they were just taking everything the Jews would get. Get in, his boy, his tribe. So here God comes and he calls on Gideon. He's going to make Gideon the deliverer. You see, once you get beat up so much by your cousins, all of a sudden you're afraid of them. <laughs> Kim people can hurt you. You even hate to see him come around. But God shows up and tells Gideon how he's going to make him a mighty man of valor and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've been beat up by, Ken people can make you feel better than anybody I know. I don't know if anybody can make you feel so small better than your kin people. You know, everybody's got him in the, everybody's got him in the family. You know, nothing you're going to do is right. Ain't you never going to be right. I don't care what you do. You know, I know your daddy. I know your grandmama. I know all y'all. You know, you, you get all that kind of stuff from kin people. But here God says, you know, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. I'm going to use you. First thing Gideon got to think about his kin people. He said, you know what? He said, oh, my Lord, uh, Judges 6 and 15, oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. I'm the least in my father's house. He goes down the line, you know, going down the line, this sob story to God, this pitiful uh, proclamation to God, how we ain't got nothing, we never had anything. But here is the Lord saying, you know, Gideon, you, you're mighty man of valor. But God ain't heard nobody say it to me. But Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. Man, do you know how hard it is to be convinced that God is calling you to be mighty? Come on. Even after he told you that. You know what Gideon said? Now, Lord, if this thing is going to be, you got to show me. Now, now it's, it's strange. People don't have to show you nothing. They just be people. You believe everything about them. But if God ever tried to convince you of something, you got to put God through that test. <laughs> I'm on fleece. <laughs> People used to ask me all the time, is it okay to fleece the Lord? Let me just give you, let me just say this to you. Fleecing is not necessary if you start believing. <laughs> Why do I have to fleece him if I believe it? Because right now, Fleecing don't bring favor. Nor does fleecing cause God to be pleased. Without faith, he didn't say without fleece. He said without faith, it's in. 
impossible. He said, yeah, but I still want to fleece the Lord. Well, then you ought to get faith. You don't have to fleece. You know, every time somebody flees something, somebody gets skipped. <laughs> so here's Gideon. God has said him who he is. But see, Gideon can't see past himself. We live in such a small world. The hardest thing for us to do is to see anything outside of where we are surviving. There may be gold just beyond your limitation, but you can't see it because of where you've been living so long. You understand? Know and so he, he can't see. You know, he's been trying to eat. He, he, he had to go out and steal wheat out the field and, 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 and winter that stuff when nobody's looking at night. And so he can't see beyond what he's been doing. And then God shows up and tells you how mighty you are and what he's going to do and how he's going to use you to save Israel. And you're looking at your position and not focusing on God's position. How many times have I looked at myself and say, no, it can't happen because I don't see him. I get fearful when I can't see him. And I started making big mistakes when I can't see him because I'm thinking only from where I am. Not from where he is, not from what he said, not from what he can do. I'm looking at it from me. All of a sudden, Jesus began to, I mean, the Lord began to show him that I'm going to make one man out of you. Going to be a bunch of you, but he's going to be just like one man. Isn't it strange if we could all get the same mind? Yes. Yeah, same mentality. And getting got those men, got a whole bunch of them. You know, once you get anointed and get inspired, you know, people get in the field and they start running. He said, man, we're going to get an army together so we can get these guys. Man, here come 30,000 people. Come on, let's go, let's go. And the more the crowd is, the more the crowd bigger the crowd, the more you can get in the crowds, you know. And, and you know, you in that crowd, you ain't got but a few people that really wants to fight. Most of them is thinking, we'll go and hope that we overwhelm them with numbers and so on, they won't fight us. Because generally when it starts to fight, you find out who's really fighting. You know, I've been, I've been in them game fights where the guy that started the fight run off at the mouth. He knows when it started getting hot, he'd be in the back hollering from the back. And here I find myself up in the front where I didn't start. So Gideon starts out and he goes to get him an army and God tells him, you know what God tells the guy? Your army is way too big. Now you got Midianites out here and out here in the valley. They're numbered like grasshoppers, which means God's way of telling you there's a buku Midianites out there, bunches. God says you got too many guys. Now I was trying to believe God. I really was trying to believe God. I said, they came up with that idea. But I'm going to go ahead and see what he said. He breaks it down. He gets this guy down to 300 men to show you how powerful unity is. He gets him down to 300 men. He said, I only thing I want you 300 people to do is the same thing at the same time when I tell you to. And if you do it at the same time, did I tell you to do it? Then I'm going to show you what I can do. It ain't because you had better weapons. It ain't because you had a bigger army. It's because you decided to be unified in me. And since you got unity in me, I'm going to show you what I can do. They broke them vessels and began to shout at the same time. The Midianites began to kill each other because of their unity. You see, the only one that feeds on unity is God. And the only one that feeds on disunity, you, you guessed it. 
You guessed it. If you want, if you want the devil to run your show, just get disunified. That's what he loves to do. He loves to put things between you and people so that y'all won't get together. He loves to keep that disunity there. And I, I'm not, I'm not, don't get me wrong. I got family members I don't deal with. Okay? But we never was in unity. <laughs> but if we ever did come to unity, then we're going to be unified. But we own two separate sides of tracks. It's not because I don't love them. Is that we never came to unity. We have never been unified. So I'm talking more about people who have now come into unity. Is that if you enter unity, you need to protect that with all costs. All right? Do whatever you can. Don't, don't mess that up because you're going to draw. You, you will draw the blessings of God to your life. You ain't even got to ask for it because it's commanded to you because the Bible says where well, that all, that unity all stops at that hymn. If I can get there, he said, the blessings of God are commanded. I don't have to worry about being blessed. I don't have to get in your $50 blessing line to get my whatever blessing you're trying to get me. Because I think all I got blessed in the $50 line was the one who was getting the $50. Hello? I wonder what would happen if I got in that line and gave him my, my P.O. box. They don't want that, though, do they? Oh, no. <laughs> I shouldn't say things like that, man, but I am. It's okay. But anyway, even, that's why today, even in our world today, most people are wanting to get out of this world more than to stay in this world and establish the kingdom of God. You know, we, we're looking for an escapism. We got to escape route. We're looking for something to get us out of here. Because we're like, we're like Gideon with those Midianites hanging over us, you know. We even got an uncle named Sam. <laughs> and he seems to be always putting the thumbs on us, you know what I'm saying? Higher taxes and all this stuff. And we just getting just way too much. The thing, prices is going crazy. You know, you know, hamburgers used to be cheap. Chicken was cheap. Now they find out you like this, so the prices is raised. We got to fake them out. But anyway, and most of the saints that live in the world today, all they can think about, oh man, this world is so bad. Lord, I can't wait to get out of this world. Could I pray? Could I? Could I read something to you real quick? Mark this in your Bible, because you know this is what Jesus had in mind in, in, in John. Uh, 17, 15, and 18. He said, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but thou should keep them from evil. In verse 18, as thou hast sent me in the world, even so I also send them into the world. Now, isn't it strange? We got saints praying to get out, and, and Jesus is praying that you stay in. Hallelujah. Now, which prayer do you think he's going to answer? Huh? Man, God, we're praying, please, Jesus, come on, get us out of here. And Jesus said, I'm praying that I don't take you out. Oh, That's not what I, his prayer, and I have to believe that what he prayed is more powerful than what you're trying to pray. Because God will never answer a prayer against his purpose. Right? So he's not, I don't care how bad you think it is. If anything, you need to realize the, the worse it gets, the more unity you, unified you need to be thinking about. It may come down to one day you may need each other. You just might need each other. And I mean you might really need each other. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. And he said, to, that's when he said to Gideon, and thou, and the Lord said unto him in Joshua 6, 16, said unto him, surely I will be with thee, then thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. He wasn't just one man. It was 300 men. But he said, when you go at this, it's going to look like it wasn't but just one man. 
And that's the reason why even now, Jesus says unto us, Ephesians 2, 15, to make in himself of twain. That's you and me. I mean, you and him. Guess what he want to make? Two separate people? No, one man. That's almost like walking around with two heads. That's called a freak. Amen. That's Barnum and Bailey stuff. You, you can't have two heads because you can't have two minds. Amen. I could say a lot more about that, but I'm going to let that ride because it, it would seem like I may be picking, but I, I ain't never understand that. I can't understand how you can have two heads. Christ is the head. Everything filtered down from that. Right? But in him, he said, I want to take the twain. What twain? He wanted to take you and him. Makes two. But he says, no, I don't want two. I just want one. Yes. So he's going to take the twain and make one new Man, and we're still trying to make it make two people. You know how? We're trying to get him to fix our flesh. When he's trying to make the new man your spirit man. Because your victory is not going to be in your flesh. Your victory is going to be even your faith in the one who calls you to become the one man. Because you'll never be able to tell God, let that man be in me. That was also in Christ Jesus. Somewhere we got to remember, God don't need your good thoughts. But he got thoughts you ain't never thought about. <laughs> God don't even need your good ways. Because your good ways will never top his way. My ways are not, how many of y'all believe that? Tell the truth, don't raise your hand. Don't say nothing, don't say nothing. I don't want you to say anything. But most people don't believe that his ways are not like ours. You know what I'm saying? Because they ain't nothing like God. You know what God does? Man, he knows I put the screws on you. And, and mess your way up so bad that you almost be mad at God. <laughs> and I know, no, no, no. We are mad at him. We just don't say it like that. But it ain't nothing like, yeah, there you go. We call it frustration. I don't know what's going on. I can't understand. I can't understand why. You know why you can't understand why? Because God ain't trying to give you a flesh understanding. Amen. You ever thought about that? Maybe what you're trying to understand is not what you need to understand. What you need to understand, you need to understand his ways are not like yours. You. Quit shooting your little bull, shooting your arrows and hitting the tree and then go out and write your bulls out around it. Huh? That's what we want. We want to be able to hit it every time. Then we mess around and get with God and God started messing up our whole plans. And we are scrapping now. It's the devil doing it and God is the one in control. Then we'll get up and say, you know, God's in control and then turn around and, let the, and say the devil's in control. We got to make up our mind. Could it be that his ways are still not like yours? Hmm? Could it be that maybe you're trying to make him act like you? And God is still in the business of making you be like him. And I wonder who's going to win. How do, you, how do you win against someone who never sleeps? How do you win against somebody who has all power? How can you win against a God that knows all things? And how could you even possibly think about winning when a God that's every word all time? Now, if he's ever worried all times, how in the world could anybody mess that up? Huh? How could, could you possibly think 
that the enemy of your soul is omnipresent, can, can be there all the time. Take your little sabbatical. Rest in him. And let God teach you his ways that you may know God like you need to know him. I guess it's time for me to quit. Y'all don't need all the numbers? No? All right. Question, comment, anything? Anything?